Hello everyone, my name is Josh and welcome to a new segment that I'm calling Musical Mondays. And today we're going to be focusing on a musical which is, simply put, a classic. Have you guessed what it is yet? Well, have you heard the word? Because it's my understanding that Grease is the word, it's the word that you heard, it's got groove, it's got meaning. Love it, it's a classic. So yeah, I'm going to be talking about the 1978 film, Musical, or Grease, starring John Travolta and the late, great Olivia Newton-John. And this musical has been a very interesting, has had a very interesting place in my life, because a lot of times that I've watched it, we had the VHS cover of Grease with Olivia Newton-John and John Travolta on the cover, and it was very kind of, you know, a, a film that I've always wanted to, I was, I was very curious about, because there was a lot of films that we had, and we had a lot of films, we had the 18 rated films at the very top of the, the shelf that we had our VHS tapes on in the early 2000s, sort of late 90s, early 2000s, and then we had the... A, a, the, the lower you got, the more it became more light-hearted. Like, you'd have the sort of, like, screwball comedies with the PG rating in the middle, and then you'd have the children's Disney films and things like that at the very bottom of the shelf, and you'd have things like Hook and Who Framed Roger Rabbit in sort of, like, the in-between section. And so it's sort of like the, the sections between the in-between, if that makes sense, or, or, or tier high than the in-between, kind of. And one of the films that really struck out stuck out to me was, was Grease because we didn't actually have the VHS tape because excuse me the VHS tape had a very interesting thing where you can clearly tell it was recorded off the te the television because the sequence at the very beginning of this film is the sequence where Sandy and Danny are at the beach and they're about to say goodbye because they've had this very long, very romantic, very windswept summer. And the song "Love Is a Many Splendid Things" is um in the in the background. Sorry for my singing, but I do have to kind of <laughs> sample a little bit of the music just so I can, you know, give you an indication of the fact that it's a musical episode. So I might break into song every once in a while, like a musical does. So um, I do apologise if you do find that annoying, but it's it's a musical themed um, YouTube video, so I thought pepper in some musical notes here and there, and um, just for for that charm. And of course, it's Monday, so of course you need a little bit of a sing song every once in a while to kind of get you out of that that, that dreary mood of oh it's Monday again. So yeah, this is the perfect thing to do. So that sequence was cut out of the original VHS version that I had. Because whenever I saw it on the DVD, it would always start off with the beach scene and then it would jump into the animated sequence. In the version that I had, it ju jumped straight into the animated sequence. And it's such a great sequence because it shows you every character and what their personality is like based on how they're designed and how they look. I mean, there's even one scene where um, a character jumps out of bed at the very start and then they just basically have just like this ball of hair. It's like a little dust mite of hair you know just round their head and they just basically squeeze the gel and the gel forms the words grease and um sandy is kind of depicted as kind of like the the snow white or the cinderella of the of the group where she's kind of like the disney princess she kind of has a deer come through the window and birds are twittering around well around her and she's looking into the mirror and then the mirror would have a still of her face and then it would show oh olivia john is and things like that so after the animated sequence, which is the one that I remember the most, a lot of people, surprisingly, when you talk about this film, they don't remember the t animated sequence. I mean, they did a version of it on Gogglebox, where they basically, the TV show Gogglebox on Channel 4, where they basically showed the film Grease, and no one remembered what the animated sequence was. Like, everyone was saying, what the hell is this? What's this got to do with Grease? And things <laughs> like that. And, I, and the same thing's like, I don't remember this. And <laughs> it's really funny because that's one of the things that I associated with Grease when I was a child, like the film that opens with an animated sequence and things like that. So oh, I remember it very well. So um, yeah, it begins and we're introduced to Danny Zuko and his gang of Greaser friends. And they're all very charming. They're all very goofy and they're all very cool and douchey in some respects. But um, they're both very kind of, you know, very typical guys. Like they're like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, what's up? Yeah, dude, all that stuff. Like, they're really going crazy. Like, yeah, what are you, what are you doing, man? And things like that. And things like that. They're really you know, happy to see each other. They're very kind of, yeah, punch you in the shoulder. How you doing, man? Like, ow, that hurt, but not really. Kind of, 
thing, and it's all really nice and all really lovely. And then we're introduced to Sandy. She is pretty much starting again. At, she's pretty much starting her day at Rydell High, which is a stereotypical 1950s high school where everyone's kind of you know of a certain group, and they will have their own little um their own little cliques and their own little you know groups or own little sectors of the school that they hang out kind of like mean girls but with a little bit more stuff with a little bit more you know um a little bit more um 1950s pizzazz i suppose and um we have the pink ladies who are headed by you know rizzo frenchie and the rest of them i've forgotten what the other one was called she's the one who has the you know, pigtails, and she has a line at one point in the film where she goes to one guy, like, oh, aren't you going to... The guy goes, aren't you going to lead? let me lead for a while? And she goes, I can't help it. I'm used to leading. <laughs> and she's he's like, okay. I love that character. She even has a scene where she's basically quoting a commercial and she does the actions as well. <laughs> at one point, like, yeah, she's a great character. I can't remember her name for the life. I mean, there's another um, member of the Pink Ladies who has one of my favourite lines where... Um, the 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 girl with the pigtails um who says i'm used to leading she says um she says um what'd she give him to, to, to this to this woman who's the head of this you know rival greaser gang um she's basically the girlfriend of this this rival guy who has to race um Kaniki and he later has to race danny and there's a scene where um she Get, the girl gives her gives her a boyfriend something for good luck, and um, one of them goes, "What'd she give him?" And the other girl goes, "A lock of hair from her chest." And I thought, <laughs> I I love lines like that. Honestly, I I love the dialogue in this movie. It's, it's so good. Um, but yeah, that, those characters are very funny, and of course, they're very kind of. They're very much in their own world. They pretty much, you know, say things like, oh, yeah, we're going to rule the school and things like that. And I I love how stylized this dialogue is. But I, but I really love the fact that they all have their own specific um, groups. But she gets kind of roped in... Uh, Sandra D gets kind of roped... Sandy kind of gets roped into this particular group, the Pink Ladies, um, via Frenchie, who is the character who's kind of on her way out of school. She wants to leave school and go into waitressing or something. But before all that, she decides to befriend Sandy and she introduces her to her friends, the Pink Ladies, the Rizzo and all, all the rest. But to me, this is a great scene because immediately they don't know how to react to her. Like, she's very kind of, you know, mild-mannered, She's very polite and she's very kind of, you know, oh, happy and very kind of, you know, oh, delighted that she's in Rydell. But she also feels a little bit isolated and alone. But there's something about her that the rest of the Pink Ladies just don't like or they're just not really that comfortable with. Or they're not really like the fact that there's even a song that they dedicated to it, which I thought was done very well. There's even a song later on that they do very well called Look At Me, I'm Sandra D, which is basically them mocking um sandy for for being this very kind of um very kind of prim and proper as they see it kind of person in a world where they're not meant to have a very classy personality so yeah they kind of find that a bit you know a bit odd so they kind of show their their their, their, their sense of them feeling it's odd through through song and i love that about this musical and i love that about musicals in general if you're doing a musical you have to know how to play the the musical game and i know a lot of people who hate musicals will say oh, that's not realistic, all the characters are bursting into song. But if you know how to do it well, you can really kind of play very interesting things. Because a lot of good musicals, if you're a good musical, you know how to use the music to the point where it feels like you're actually helping the audience understand something about a character, how they're feeling internally, what they're feeling in the grand scheme of things. Because I think Greece is a great showcase for this particular idea because as the story goes on, these characters do have their own songs and they do have their songs where they do actually get the chance to not only literally be in the spotlight, but literally open themselves up and literally show their vulnerabilities. Like there's this really wonderful scene and there's this really wonderful scene. Um, there's a song... Um, um, the song that Danny sings in the in the drive-in at one scene to do with Sandy and um he basically shows how he's changed a lot since being with 
with Sandy and how he feels like he's a, he's a different person now. He doesn't feel like he's the person he was where he's constantly putting on front for his friends. He's acting like a tough guy and he's like, Oh yeah, I don't know. Maybe there's two of me kind of thing, <laughs> kind of thing. He, he doesn't have that mentality anymore. He feels like he's, he's very so stripping away the, the facade of the tough guy. And he really just kind of shows that through her, through being with her, he's actually, you know, starting to change and started to grow as a person. And that's brilliantly done, but there's also really other great episode, uh, great musical sequences. The first one, um, Summer Lovin', is a great sequence because it showcases um, one scene that we've already seen um, being described in being described in retrospective through the point of view of two specific people of two specific genders, and. It's very interesting because, first of all, you have the perspective of Danny, who's kind of talking about, it, like, oh, yeah, we, we, we had an exciting time. I met a girl and things like that, and we all had a good time. And they're like, oh, you met a girl. What did you do? Did you do? Did you make out with her under the docks and things like that? Uh, and things like that. And, and, and she's kind of like saying, oh, it was all very romantic, and we had a really nice time. I'm he's <laughs> and he's kind of bigging himself up as this hero there's even the line where he goes I saved her life she and Lily drowned and she basically sings back he showed off splashing around and and things like that and it, it just really shows the different perspectives but it's also a really fun song and I, I, I love the uh the moment at the end <laughs> where um one of them says um where Sandy says something has to come to an end and one of the boys in the the uh, the Grease segment goes, can she give me a friend? And then there's this moment where they grab him by the shoulders and they plunk him down on the stills and one of them flips their sunglasses and you hear a boing sound effect. <laughs> I, I love stuff like that because it is showing it's kind of cartoony in a way and I think that's what's really great about Grease is it kind of takes itself, it doesn't take itself too seriously but it knows how to use the musical sequences in a very interesting way. And it's just such a great opening sequence. And then it kind of ends in this beautiful combination, high note hitter between both these incredibly talented performers, John Travolta and the late great Olivia Luton John. She does it perfectly. And I think it's deliberately kind of meant to be off key with John, John Travolta because he, he, he he kind of obviously he, he tries to hit the night high notes as best he can, bless him, and you really do kind of feel that in his performance. But yeah, it it's a great song, it's wonderfully done, and I just feel like that's an example of how you use musical sequences, musical moments in a musical film to your advantage, and you're telling a story through these songs. And that can often turn a lot of people off because people wonder why these characters all of a sudden just bursting into song. But the best musicals really do try to use the formula in a way where it feels like you're actually getting something. If you're not, if you're not learning something about the character through this song or, some, or something like that, <coughs> you're immediately just trying to move the plot along or you're trying to showcase a development in the story. But they never just use songs for the sake of it. They'll always use songs to kind of highlight a character's personality or they'll try to use a song to kind of, you know, show how much these characters have come come a long way and come to grips with themselves and learn to love themselves and appreciate themselves for each other. And there are even some sequences where they don't sing at all and they're just basically, it's just window dressing and background dressing or a sense of... They're, them doing a pastiche of the 1950s like the entire prom sequence is basically a their version of a 1950s you know type jig essentially or a jive and this is actually really nice because it's a great you know icebreaker moment because it's something that would actually happen in real life if you were in a 1950s type dance or themed dance then of course you have you have something like that and it really just kind of adds a certain level of, of, of calm to proceedings. But the rest of the time, they're just bursting into song. And the songs you usually do are very character focused because a lot of the songs do kind of either showcase a character's, a character's either trying to motivate other people or a character is trying to showcase how much they don't like another person or how much they find a person very kind of uptight in the case of the Sandra D um, song that Rizzo sings, or you have um, 
the song that um Danny sings in the drive in Sandy Why Oh Why, um, uh, which I think is a great song because it shows how how much Danny has grown as a person and how much he doesn't really care about how other people see him. He loves Sandy and he's gonna let the whole world know it. But that entire sequence is just beautifully done, and I just feel like it's just so beautifully shot as well. Like that scene where he turns round and you see the lights of the of the projector like casting off through him and you could have seen him in silhouette through the the projection reel and the smoke i think that was just such a great idea it felt like a very 80s image as well it, it felt very weird because of course this is a, in 1978 which is at the tail end of the 70s but you really do get that feel that it's a very 80s kind of shot you'd expect something like that to happen in footloose or something like that like a very 80s style thing but i actually really love that sequence too and of course an old friend of mine did his version of that song in his college production of greece so i thought that was actually very interesting and i'm covering greece several years later andrew if you're watching this i hope you're doing well and i hope to talk to you very soon soon um so yeah um shameless plug but i'm but i don't care i'm gonna say how he is but um, I personally think this is a great example of when musicals do it right. And if a song's not introducing you to a character or a character's personality, it should be kind of, you know, used to an effect where it's somehow moving the story along or kind of tying into a sort of theme that they want to play with. Grease doesn't have a theme, so it's just basically going through the uh, the the... The story through trying to get these characters either motivated to do something or they're talking about characters particular predicament in the case of a song that Rizzo sings calls it's called it's the worst things that, I, that there are worst things I could do which is a great song because it shows a little bit of vulnerability because she is a she's a very kind of hard very tough kind of exterior like she handles herself with Kaniki who's basically the major tough guy you think you think Dan is the the, the tough guy pretender Kaniki is that guy too he's a blonde hair and he has that in typical grease hair kind of, I love the fact that you know stereotypical of this kind of film I love the scene where they basically have this little heart to heart Danny and Kaniki and they basically you know and, oh yeah I'm, I'm feeling you know kind of out of it as well and he goes oh yeah i really care about you man and things like that and they have this hug and then they, they notice that their friends are watching them and then they're like yeah yeah go ahead and they get out their combs and they just start combing their hair <laughs> like going yeah yeah go for it man like yeah punch you in the shoulder and yeah yeah go for it like yeah yeah we're fine yeah we're, we're mates yeah like <laughs> that kind of thing and yeah we we get it you guys are actually sweethearts deep down so yeah that's actually really wonderful and um I love that entire that, that time moment because it's just really funny, but I but I love the use of the song. There are worse things I could do because it really just shows Riz's vulnerability. She's usually a very tough person, especially around Kaniki because he's a guy who is very kind of strong and tough, but she she can handle herself around him. She knows how to you know deal with stuff. She knows how to deal with his his pun the pun his BS. Pardon, pardon my language, but it, he, she knows how to handle his BS. And there's, it comes at a point where she kind of feels herself in a very vulnerable place because she's pregnant. And if you're a teenager and you're pregnant in the 1950s, people immediately think you're a bit of a, you tend to sleep around a lot, which isn't a very good name to put to someone don't care what background they come from but to me I, th I feel I felt very sorry for, for Rizzo in this instance because she literally is in a very vulnerable position with this song and she shows that you know she shows that she can be vulnerable she can be alone she can be sad but to be sad in front of her friends or to be sad in front of the man that she loves that's something that she couldn't do and but then there there are worse things that she could do as well <clears throat> and i absolutely love how that song basically personifies her vulnerability but it does so in a place of strength where she feels like she she's gonna be okay and i like that about that entire song because it basically shows that she's in a vulnerable situation but that's the beauty of the musical and i think that's what greece does so well and all the songs are great. Even the songs at the very end, like, you know, what Bumaloo and Blot Wemboo kind of thing. And um, that song. And um, 
it has a very weird ending where um it has a very weird ending because this film has garnered a lot of controversy in recent years because they say oh it's very racist because there isn't any black people in it and it's very homophobic because there aren't many same-sex couples in this film well think about think about what the film is the film is essentially a pastiche of 1950s high school essentially it's it, it's basically how high schools probably would have been in the 1950s where it's very kind of you know all about the dresses and all about the fashion and all about the cars and everything like that and everyone could have had either gums in their hair or they had greaser jackets with their hair kind of combed in that very kind of james dean style so there's a lot of stuff going on but think about when it was made think about what time period it's set in it's set in the 50s and in the 50s there was a lot of stuff going on if you were a black man or a black woman and you were a black teenager you probably wouldn't be allowed to mingle with white men and white women and that's because there was a little thing called racism and segregation there's a musical version of hairspray which basically gives context to this entire period and it's a great musical in its own right and it's based on a film by john waters who is probably one of my favorite directors he directed a film called pink flamingos which i love and um he's just a really great director and he even has a cameo in the original hairspray which i absolutely love and divine plays the mum and of course in the remake john travolta plays the mum full circle but yeah um it was a little thing called segregation which is where black people couldn't go to the same schools as white people they had to go to their own schools and if they even if they had to go to the bathroom they would have separate stalls for black men and black women and they'd have you know separate um they would even go as far as to when they mean when you know black people and white people mingled together in a club they would literally have a a line drawn out on the floor so that white people had to stay on one side of the room whilst black people had to stay on the other and it's totally absurd so sometimes there'd be different nightclubs for white people and black people so it's a lot of there was a lot of you know segregation going on and if you want to hear more about that there's the film um the film hairspray which obviously gives a lot of context which we'll be talking about <coughs> excuse me at some point during my musical mondays because it's a really good musical in its own right and the songs are damn catchy i love it and um it's a great musical but there, there, there was a segregation with with black people so that's the reason why you don't see many black people in Rydell High because it's a mostly all white school and um, that's basically what it is and um, it, it, in, in regards to not having many gay characters well that's because if you were gay in the 1950s it was, con it was considered an illegal act and if you were ever outed as gay you would be arrested there on the spot or if you ever came out as gay you'd be arrested there on the spot and if you were lucky if you were lucky and you came from um privilege or if, if you were the the son of a doctor or the daughter of a doctor or a nurse or anybody in any kind of respectable position you'd get the option to either stay incarcerated or you could have your, be given the option to get chemically castrated which is you'd take a series of pills which would cut off your sexuality. You'd have no real sexual attraction to anybody, not just of your own gender, but to anybody. You would literally be chemically asexual. And that's kind of horrible. And I think that's worse than death to me. E, the idea that you, you, you've basically been chemically altered to not be attracted to anybody, full stop. And that's kind of horrible to, to, to me where, you know, you're you're forced to be in that position whereas um yeah it's, it's it's really horrible um but then there are people who are asexual by choice and of course that's wonderful oh that's amazing that you can you know feel comfortable not being attracted to anybody but i think in the case of being chemically castrated for having your sexuality forcibly taken from you that's horrible that's really horrible and i think it's it, it's worse than death to me and of course prison is bad too but to me i think you know um that really is one of the the big things that i really do find quite upsetting and of course if you were gay you'd often you know be um arrested or chemically castrated if you were of noble stock as it were but 
to me, I I think they're both bad. But to me, I don't think that's a reason to criticise the film because I think the film is still good. It still does it still does stuff well. It still manages to tell an engaging story using the the medium of the musical, using the songs. And they're all very catchy. And as long as you can remember the songs and what place they feel they have in the overarching story, and if it really engages you in that way, that's 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 something to be praised. That's good storytelling. So to me, I, th- I think that's the thing. That, that's not a reason to criticise the film. In fact, you should probably praise the film because it's actually being more period accurate. Um... But it was also released in the 1970s, which, of, of course, was for a lot of political change in America, going through a lot of political change in America. So they probably could have changed a few things around or they could have included a few scenes where, you know, um, characters were going into, you know, clubs where they were where they were allowed to mingle together or something like that and, and give more context to the time period. But that's what books are for. So uh, if you want to find out more about... Um, particular periods in history you can go and look it up and you can you know see see well why why wasn't this the case why wasn't you know black people allowed to mingle with white people in you know society in the 1950s well you can just look that up you can just go to google or you can read a book look and you can figure out you, you, you can basically look it up you don't have to you know oh bad a film or boycott a film because they came out years ago because you think it's racist because it doesn't include black people in high high school along with white people because as much as people like to think in society now society and history doesn't have rose tinted glasses it pretty much is bleak and it really is not very nice yes there are there are instances where like with greece where they could have looked at it through a very rose tinted lens but to me those sorts of types of periods weren't the happiest of times. If you were, you know, a, a, a particular group, if you were black or if you were gay or if you were disabled or in any other different cultural space, you weren't treated very well. And that's something that I think a lot of people kind of hated about this musical. But I still think it's okay because it's, it's okay not to include... Um, the ugliest side of history because you're basically telling a pastiche a very glamorized pastiche so to me um, you really do kind of feel like you have to sacrifice those darker elements in order to tell a good story whereas with Hairspray I think Hairspray basically mastered it where they told a very dark and very serious issue through the lens of the musical and there's this really beautiful song in Hairspray that Queen Latifah sings while she's going on the march a segregation march and it's a beautiful song and Queen Latifah is just an amazing person overall she's an amazing actress she's an amazing singer but her singing of that song really does show that she has had enough and she wants to literally show that she's proud to be black she's proud to be who she is and she's proud to stand with her brothers and sisters her children and literally stand up to the government and say you know what we don't want to do this anymore we want to come and mingle with 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 people we want to feel like we're people and not just a marginalized group and i i loved that about that moment in in hairspray and i will be talking more about the musical version of hairspray as well as the john waters version for musical monday so stay tuned that's all i have to say about um about greece the song itself grease lightning is basically a a motivator type song where they're saying, oh, girls will love us if we have this car and we can make it wonderful and we can make it fantastic. And I thought it was going to be like Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, where it was just like, oh, the car has kind of like its own magical feel to it. Or it could be like Christine, where it <laughs> wants to kill you. Um, but yeah, I, I absolutely love that song too. It's very full of innuendo. There's a lot of innuendo in that song. That's probably why a lot of people kind of, you know, don't know what to think about it. But to me... I think it's a really good song. It's it's catchy. It's hilarious. It's also really kind of heavily stylized because there's a sequence where they go into a fantasy sequence and they make up the car and they've all got these very glossy outfits. But I do want to give a special mention to the song um, Beauty School Dropout, which is a song that Rizzo kind of hears her guardian angel sing. This is a great song because it's very it's very John Waters. John Waters didn't direct Grease, but it would have been amazing if he did. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think John Waters, if he directed a musical sequence, this is what it would be like. like these ca- 
the Guardian I enjoy is just really kind of blunt about it. And he says, you know, your story's sad to tell, her DNA engineer do well. Um, no customer would go to you unless you were a hooker. <laughs> and you have to basically make up your face to, you know, look beautiful because no one's going to want to hire you because you look very plain, you look very kind of all over the place. You don't have any qualifications, you're not intelligent. So what are you thinking about, you know, going out and getting a job as a waitress or whatever? Because no one's going to want you. You're, you're really kind of, you know, on the shelf, kind of. So go back to high school, get a qualification. It's actually got a very positive message to it, even though he's kind of insulting her, basically. And it's a great sequence. And I always thought the guy who sang it was David Hasselhoff. I have no idea why, but for some strange reason, he reminded me a bit of David Hasselhoff. But I love the song because it's just so underrated. And it's one of the songs that whenever my sister my sisters or my parents were watching this. They'd always skip this song. And I actually found on the VHS version, I thought, why? It's actually a really fun song. It's really funny. It's very kind of blunt, but that's just me. I, lo I love these kind of very much more darker <laughs> um, songs. And I, I love these very blunt characters and all these other things in musicals a lot of the time, kind of breaking that sentimental veil kind of. But I absolutely love this song. Oh, it's amazing. And the ending pretty much is Kanicki gets knocked out. He has to race this this rival greaser guy, but Danny decides to race him for them. He wins, and Sandy decides to change her image so that she can be with Danny because she doesn't want him to sacrifice who he is so that she he can be with her. <clears throat> and this has also garnered its fair share of controversy because... Danny, throughout the course of the, the film, is trying to improve himself better. Like, he's trying to get into sports like wrestling, running, and baseball. But all the time, he keeps on, you know, punching someone in the face or tripping over one of the hurdles when he's doing the track and things like that. But she doesn't want that. She wants, you know, him to be him. And he's goofy and he's lovable and he's just so charming. That smile. Honestly, when John Travolta smiles, like, you can't help but kind of get butterflies like I certainly do whenever I watch this movie and and yeah it, it definitely has that thing so who who doesn't want to see him smile like seriously it's truly wonderful and truly charming but to me I, I, I feel like that was one of the things that really turned people off because Sandy and ends up changing herself for him and a lot of people kind of think well why should she have to change if he's the one who's doing it but to me and, and I think Olivia Newton-John actually justified this in her in her um, chat on loose women where I think they were also discussing the topic of the controversy of is it racist is it also homophobic and things like that uh, uh, as well and she basically said well the reason why she changes she, she doesn't see it as she has to change for him she sees it as oh they're both on the same page in the sense that they both want each other and they're willing to make, you know, this incredible sacrifice in order to do it. She's willing to be more adventurous and be more, you know, stylized and sassy with her, her line where she's having a cigarette and she goes, he goes, Sandy. And <laughs> she goes, tell me about it, stirred. And things like that. And I thought, that's just brilliant. But she's, she's willing to let go a little bit and so is he. And I think that's what the major point of that scene is, is they're supposed to be kind of meeting in the middle and um, they're, they're learning to let go a little bit more. And I think that's the whole entire point of the entirety of this film is they're letting go a little bit more because he wears a Rydell jumper as well as his, besides his greeter's jacket. So he's, he's changing as well. She isn't the only one who's making that big step. She is as well. So to me, it's a positive ending. And then, of course, it ends in that wonderful dance. And boy, they're all at the fair. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I wish I had a fair when I, when I ended my exams and it was the end of the school year. Like, I wish I had that. Like, my God, kids in the 1950s <laughs> were very, you know, kids in this movie were so lucky, not in the 1950s, but in, in, you know, in the movie, they were, they were very lucky to have a fair at the end. But to me, I think, um, it was a beautiful movie. It was fantastically, um, done it was directed by a guy by the name of alan carr would you believe it with two l's and i can't help but think that the guy who made 
chatty man and you know all those classic game show revivals and the friday night project with justin e collins i kept imagining him being the director of this and i thought wow he came from very humble beginnings but no he was just a comedian a british comedian but this is a different alan carr because of course it's with two l's and an e (laughs) E, but yeah i actually found that really funny that that someone was called alan carr who made this and yeah I, i actually love that and of course i think it was with yeah i think it was with two r's as well so yeah it's it's a good film and it ends in the ultimate dream sequency kind of way, which is a little lot of the fan theories. Very funny fan theories, but it kind of, like with a lot of fan theories, it tends to ruin your enjoyment of the film once you know all the details. And there was even one that I saw this morning when I got up where they basically says, oh, Finding Nemo isn't really there in Finding Nemo. It's just basically a construct that, you know, Marlon made just so he could be you know, just so he could cope with the fact that he's lost all his children and his wife. And I thought, thanks for that, whoever made that fan theory. You've really kind of made me a bit more depressed about a really lovely film. Thank you. So, yeah, there's been fan theories about this, that, you know, Sandy is basically in a coma and she's invented this. She basically nearly drowned, literally, in the song Summer Lovin'. And the entire thing is basically her fantasy is she's basically slipping into um into the afterlife essentially and i actually find it very weird that i'm actually covering this having covered as my first video for this channel um marabou sort nightmare which is about a guy in a coma basically trying to relive his life or trying to remember his past whilst also you know living that alternate present where he's in you know both the hospital room but then he's also in south africa trying to you know kill this marabou stalk but Granted, this one's a little bit more light-hearted because it's musical, there's fun, there's style, whereas Marabou Stalk Nightmare can be a very heavy hitter. So, yeah, check out my video for Marabou Stalk Nightmare if you want to know more information on that novel by Irvin Welsh, the author of Train Spotting. It was a fantastic video, I enjoyed making it, and usually I hate watching myself back and I really hate the sound of my voice, but I've actually watched my review and I actually felt like it wasn't bad for a first time, you know, for a first time video. So I hope you enjoyed this video and look forward to more every Monday on Musical Monday. Take care. Bye.